Okay. Oh, that's a good way to start. I'm all red now. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Alrighty, so if we're good to start, then I'll just go ahead and kick it off. So, hi everyone, my name is Claire Buchanan, and I am an ambassador with the Kingston Conservancy. Uh, thanks for joining us for the Diverse Passion of Photography webinar with Arnie Stenessen. We would like to begin by acknowledging that the land on which we gather in the is in the territory of the Haudenosaunee, Anishinaabeg, Wendat, and Métis people. Their territory is covered by the Upper Canada Treaties, and we are all treaty people. This is the last webinar as part of our 2020 Adapted Passport to Nature program. All of the webinars we hosted this year were made possible because of our wonderful sponsors. Um, Arnie, is it possible we could switch to the next slide, please? Oh, okay. Yeah. You have the, yeah, there you go. Perfect, thank you. Uh, please consider supporting these businesses. All of them are local and are doing great work to protect nature. And next slide again, please. Uh, before we hop into the presentation, we ask for you to stay on mute and to keep your cameras off just so that there are no distractions while the presenter is speaking. If you have any questions during the webinar, please write them in the chat box and make sure to send them to the Huge Chain Conservancy. And then, next slide again. Um, if you haven't already done so, we recommend changing your view to speaker view so that you can see who is talking on the full screen. If you are joining from a computer, you need to click the button that says speaker view on the top right hand corner. And uh, there's a little infographic here on the slide that displays that with the red circle around it. Um, and then next slide again, please. If you are joining by an iPad, uh, you need to select the switch to active speaker button that's located on the top left hand side of the screen. If you only see the presenter and not the shared screen, you will need to select the presenter screen that is shown on the bottom right hand corner. And then there's two more infographics there just displaying that. And next slide, please. The Conservancy is a nonprofit, non governmental land trust with the help of thousands of supporters like you. We have been able to protect over 13,000 acres of natural areas in the Kujiching and Severn region. Hundreds of, hundreds of volunteers help us care for the nature reserves through citizen science monitoring, trail maintenance, and more. Next slide. This is a map showing all of the nature reserves that our community of supporters help protect in the region. Many Conservancy-owned nature reserves are open to the public, with a total of 13 kilometers of hiking trails. We have just acquired two new nature reserves, which are the Taylor property and the Whitney property. Thank you. Thanks to our supporters. Next slide. Perfect. So our presenter for this evening is Arnie Stenison. From a very young age, Arnie has been a naturalist who has great admiration and respect for nature. He combined his hobby of birding with photography over 25 years ago, and since his semi-retirement a few years ago, he has had the time to improve his photo uh, photographic skills in the field and in the digital darkroom. He is a self-taught photographer and can be found exploring local and distant trails on foot, patiently waiting under a blind for an elusive species or paddling quiet, wa paddling quiet waters in his kayak. Please welcome Arnie. Okay. Um, thanks a lot, um, and, uh, and the Conservancy for inviting me, and the Cardenfield Naturalists for inviting me into your homes. Um, this is a really strange thing for me to be able to do this. Um, I can't see you. You can see me, and uh, I hope I pulled this off because this is a brand new thing for me. Um, but um, what I want to do tonight is go through my portfolio. And I picked my, the highlights of, um, of pictures. And I have a special meeting behind all these pictures. And uh, what I wanted to go, do was go through uh, from the start. I, I went, well, I'm, I like birds. Everybody knows that I like birds. Everybody knows me. Um, but I've expanded my range now into landscapes, flowers, animals. Basically, everything now is, is my canvas. So. Um, so here's a, a whole bunch of slides. I hopefully it's hopefully it's eye candy for you. Um, my favorites, and then it's a little story um, story behind every one. I'm gonna kind of zip through a few, and then I'll slow it on in others. This is where the feedback. I won't be able to get feedback from you because I won't hear the oohs and the ahs, which I hope <laughs> hope you're doing. And um, but so I'll just try to time it uh, for the next uh, next hour, hour and a half. Um, got a bunch of slides and um, 
and um, we'll see we'll see where it goes. So when I uh, when I titled this presentation, I thought it was a a good uh, wander through my mind and my my portfolio. And because I consider myself a naturalist, I thought, well, I'll just take everybody through, you know, all all the the interesting things uh, that I do, and um, and go from there. And I, if you have questions, just uh, send them off to the conservancy there as the host, and then I'll try to answer as many questions as I can at the end. And if you have other questions, and then of course we can answer them later as well. So to start off, this is uh, Monument Valley in Utah. Diane, were, Diane and I were there in 2017. And uh, this is a view from the View Hotel. Um, if you ever get a chance to go there, this is a remarkable place. And I have uh, uh, many opportunities, of course, for the big buttes and the landscapes. And then um, this is why I got up at five o'clock in the morning to get uh, the, the perfect sunrise. And so you could see that it was almost the same as the one before. So I prepped, um, I prepped overnight. I used apps to see where the sun was going to come up, and I placed my tripod in the right spot. Hopefully, uh, hopefully I'll be able to get the uh, the sunrise. So um, a lot of you who watch TV and movies, you might recognize this spot. This is uh, Forest Gump Hill. I think I'm tired. I'm going to turn around now. This is where he. Uh, this is where he actually where it was filmed, and uh, so this was in my list, my bucket list of places to go. Um, so this is kind of you don't see this in the picture, but this is a very tricky shot because if I was to point the camera behind me, there's a big curve. So if you walked out in the middle of the road and you weren't paying attention, a semi is going to going to run you over so you had to do a little bit of prep to get this shot so I we parked a car over on the left there you can probably see the shadow and I set up my camera I had my tripod all set up I had it really low to the ground and uh, I did all my settings as to what they uh, would be to get the shot and then uh, Diane was my guide and she watched my back and I ran out into the middle of the road and I put my tripod on the ground and I took my shot and then ran back for safety. And, um, and I checked to make sure I got the shot and I did. So um, anyways, that's kind of, a, kind of an interesting shot there. I wonder if those skid marks were for, or, uh, where someone's almost gonna be hitting a photographer. <laughs> Makes me wonder. Next shot is a, another one of the bucket list shots that I wanted to get while we were in Arizona. And this is uh, Cathedral Rock. Um, from Sedona and um, we went here and then of course I took the picture but one thing that's kind of interesting about this picture you see some little white thing there in the middle by the shore that's someone's shoe and I left that there to remind myself that I to remind myself if I ever entered this picture in a contest that I, this is not an accurate representation because I had to photoshop all the people out that were all swimming on the other side. Anyways, I thought that was just a little, little humorous. Nonetheless, I, uh, I got the shot. This is Algonquin Park. And of those of you that have been to Algonquin, this is right from the Lake of Two Rivers picnic ground. And uh, Diane and I were, were there in, uh, in the fall, as you can tell. And um, you can see this scene pretty much all the time. But what you don't see is the red canoe. And Diane and I were having lunch at the, uh, the little picnic area there. And then I saw the canoe coming in from the left. And I ran to the car to get my camera because I knew, instantly knew, somehow I knew in my mind that that would make the shot. And um, so that's how that canoe got there. And, um, and it, it actually works really well, I think. And um, I really liked all the mist in the air and a, a really nice, uh, dreamy, typical Algonquin, uh, Algonquin picture. Oh, I um, wanted to mention, um, in all my photographs, I have the metadata 
So I have the shutter speed, uh, ISO and uh, aperture. If, uh, if there's any particular pictures that you want the metadata for, um, you can also add that as a, as a question and I can give that to you. That's how I learned a lot about photography. You see people's pictures and then you get the, uh, you get the settings and you kind of go, oh yeah, okay, I can do that and, uh, and see how they did it. Next shot is also one from Algonquin. And it's kind of an interesting shot. It's always been one of my favorites. This is taken, this is a, um, from, um, the tree is from Mew Lake. There is a little um, point of land that sticks out. And those of you who have been there, you, you may recognize this little tree that's there struggling for life. And I took this shot with my 500 millimeter lens across the road from the parking lot, which goes into Bat Lake Nature Trail. And um, we were there on a uh, September morning, early September morning, when you have that really night, cold weather, cold nights, and warm days, and all the mist is rising off the lakes. And um, when I took this picture, I, I could almost visualize what was going to happen here. And I got home and, uh, and I started editing it and um, it was a landscape. I made it into a portrait picture, an up and down picture. And then what I did was I used a piece of software called uh, um, from Nick and I decolored the entire picture and I recolored only the leaves or the needles of the pine tree, which kind of gives it that really dreamy, um, dreamy effect. Now, if you see those white spots, like right here and here, those are spider webs and here. So that's kind of a, kind of a neat picture. This is um, from last fall um, when I did a tour up uh, Northern Ontario with a friend of mine. And at, uh, this is Onaping Falls, which is just north of Sudbury. So this was uh, one of the, the, big, dram I, um, the big dramatic picture, uh, what I was looking for. Lots of color, lots of pop there. And then I had a slow shutter speed uh, to make that silky, the silky waterfall, waterfall look. Uh, wide angle lens and um, just kind of a capture that whole, uh, that whole fall scene. A similar picture to that. Um, is this one. Now I saw Cameron Curran was on online here and Cameron had a picture similar to this last week and this is the Shoots Provincial Park in Massey and um, this is the interesting thing about different photographer, photographers because we all have different interpretations of what we want to capture. I did this with a 15 millimeter lens and I tried to capture as much as I could with trying to get in the, the leaves of the tree on the left, um, make motion with the waterfall by choosing a slower shutter speed. Um, and um, that's, that's where I went with that one. And of course, some dramatic cloud in the sky and try to make all that all fit into a nice pleasing image. On that tour, we also went through um, Manitoulin Island and there's a very popular waterfall called Bridal Vale Falls uh, right on the not very far off the main road and this is another one, one of those uh, shots I um, right trying to create some dreamy dreamy effect now this one I did with uh, in-camera HDR so high dynamic resolution and the reason I did that because this is not the, the best time of the day to be shooting and this was midday that we were here. You know, so there was still lots of, um, there was a lot of contrast of colors and light. Um, but I, I took HDR which allows us to do different ranges of colors and light. And um, I did that in the camera. So I was able to come away with a, a pleasing image. So the um, a regular picture that I was taking from this, the, the trees were washed out and then the waterfalls were, were too light or, or was, was the opposite. You know, if I tried to expose for the trees or the blue sky and then it didn't work for the waterfalls, you know. So I did a HDR uh, and this one and that worked out. 
And if you look down below here, you see all these little black dots. These are salmon, Chinook salmon, that are, are intending to jump that waterfall. And while we were there, we didn't see anybody very successful. Um, and then, uh, they probably breed in the creek here. But they just all instinctively try to go up as far as they can. Anyways, that's uh, Bridal Veil vale Falls. And it's a different pose to, you know, like it's not a head on uh, a waterfall shot. And it's uh, to the side, which kind of gives it that nice, you know, so you can almost look like you can walk behind the waterfall. Another waterfall, this is the last waterfall that I have, or water shot. Um, a landscape one anyways. This is uh, High Falls in Cap Kippewan Provincial Park up near Englehart. So this is another midday shot and I used a uh, neutral density filter. So I could take this picture at 30 seconds. So this is uh, 30 seconds of light coming in, but it's really neutralized because I, I wanted to um, really create this feeling of motion. And you can see that, and, and if, you're, if, you're a, if, you're a, if we were able to look at a bubble in the water, we would be able to follow it. So what that long exposure does is it follows you know, these little bubbles and it just makes trails and trails of them. And then um, as I was doing that, I, I, um, when I go to waterfalls now and the rivers and I, look, and I uh, scope them out for a picture, I always try to look for little whirlpools and then that little whirlpool is uh, created here in, in this picture. And um, so I, I have an eye for that now and, uh, and you can do that with neutral density filters. So this is 30 seconds. And um, so it allowed me to create a picture in the middle of the day and um, with a very slow shutter speed and create this sense of motion um, in, in the river. Okay, from Englehart, we're going to zip up to Lion's Head, Lion's Head, Ontario, where we call home now. This is the Lion's Head Peninsula, very popular for hiking, uh, home of the Lion's Head Provincial Park. And there's a road that skirts the bay, here, Lion's Head Bay, or no, it's not Lion's Head Bay, it's Isthmus Bay. Isthmus, easy for me to say, I guess. But anyways, I set up here, I use an app called PhotoPills. And this app tells me when the sun is going to go up or rise and when the sun's going to be uh, going down or when it's going to come up. And it allows me to make strategic decisions on where I'm going to stand for a picture. So I've been trying to get this shot again. Um, since last year, since this was in May this year, and I've been trying to get it again, and I haven't been able to coordinate uh, between clouds and rain and clear skies. But this is, the sun had just gone down and it cast the light, enough light to light up the moon as the moon was coming up over the Lion's Head uh, Peninsula. So beyond the moon, beyond Lion's Head Peninsula is, is Georgian Bay. If you, if you can kind of uh, visualize where this was taken. And um, I do have, you know, I took a variety of pictures of this one with different focal lengths and that. And I picked this one because it actually casts a little bit of a, sh uh, a little bit of a nice little reflection there in the foreground. Um, and then of course, it's got the nice golden light from the setting sun on, on the rocks there on the bluff. Most people would recognize this, uh, this particular site. This is uh, Flower Pot Island. And I picked this one just to, just, just to illustrate Flower Pot Island. And uh, that, that it is possible to get both flower pots that exist on, in one picture. And I have to confess that I did uh, rub out quite a few people for this picture. It is a very popular now. And um, so there's people all over the place. And uh, so just painstakingly uh, Photoshop everybody away and then I come away with kind of a uh, what I think is a pleasing image with the colors of the Georgian Bay and the and the nice blue blue waters. Also in, uh, in Bruce Peninsula National Park you might have heard of a, a place called the Grotto. Very busy as well. It's so busy that they have time parking now. You only have four hour slots to be able to park. 
And um, that was because they're just insanely busy and uh, now it's limited to a certain number of people. And um, it actually, with the pandemic this year, it was, uh, it was very busy as well, but they, they reduced the capacity again by another half. So it was very rare to get in there uh, to, to see the grotto. Anyways, this is inside the grotto. So if you've ever been to the grotto, you probably would have been visiting up here. You would have seen it from this vantage point, and then it would have been all dark looking into the grotto here. But this was last um, last year, not this past winter, but the winter before when Georgian Bay froze over, and we were able to walk out on the ice and then walk into the grotto. And uh, for the bird lovers uh, in the audience, uh, have you know that pigeons are uh, pigeons live in the grotto. They're here all the time. They're in all various caves along the, along the coast. And then, so I had to be very careful, not only with my footing in the ice here, not to fall over, but not to sit in pigeon poo, because <laughs> there's a lot of it in here. And so this is a picture inside looking at, at the grotto. Sad to say, this is coming soon to uh, areas near us and you, depending where you are. Um, out driving, the, um, we have, we're on the, in where I live, there is uh, really long, uh, big, wide, flat areas, and the winds howl, and we get lots of snow. And um, I try to, I try to, the technique of minimalism, you know, so you take an object and you, kind of minimalize it in the frame and still tell a story. So this was, uh, we have many opportunities to do that here. So um, anyways, this is just on the road to our house and I just framed it so that one tree was there and you can still see the little bit of a fence and you can kind of see a little bit of a forest in the very background. But anyways, it's just kind of a little solemn picture um, that I enjoy. This is um, this past winter, and here we are close to the grotto. The grotto is over this hill here, but this is Indian Head Cove, which is very popular with uh, summer visitors. So when the summer visitors come to the grotto, they inevitably end up here, uh, swimming and sitting in the sun and having lunch and enjoying the weather. Um, but this was last winter, and it was uh, a winter wonderland, right? Almost from the beginning, we had uh, uh, terrific winds and then it froze and which froze all the trees, as you can see. And it created a, uh, a really nice winter wonderland for, for photography. And um, I made, uh, I think about five or six trips here. Um, I made it here uh, when it was uh, when it was cloudy and it was just um, and I just couldn't get a picture out of it. So um, I vowed that I would go back when it was sunny, just so that we can get some more uh, contrast in the picture. Um, so Di and I made a trek back in, and um, it um, it worked out really really well. Um, I, I'll, a little funny story about being here. I got a new Apple Watch, and the Apple Watch has a alert on it that tells you if you fall, it, it calls emergency services and, and it asks you, did you fall? We detected a fall, are you okay? And then you have to tell the watch, yeah, I'm okay. Anyways, this is the first time that uh, the watch actually worked. Well, it actually worked, um, told me, hey, you fell, because I did fall. I fell on the ice, I fell on my butt. So um, anyways, <laughs> I'll, uh, I'll remember that for a long time. But anyways, here's lots of icicles, really, uh, really powerful picture, I think. This is the Lion's Head Lighthouse. This is what it looked like uh, October 31st, to, uh, 2019. So this was a uh, terrific win. Uh, they just pounded, pounded this lighthouse and uh, it was just relentless. And, um, and I went down with my, my 
camera, of course. And then I just cranked off to like three or 400 pictures, all trying to capture um, some sort of action, some kind of uh, way to tell the story of the, the power of the winds against the lighthouse. And what I was visualizing was uh, a poster that I've always seen as a, as a growing up, and I always pictured that lighthouse that you could see with all the waves coming around it. And that's the picture that I was, was hoping for. And, um, and that's what I was striving for. So um, you can see that first picture I just showed you was one, one angle, then I went across the, the lion's, over to the Lion's Head Beach, and, uh, and I went from another angle uh, with a bigger lens, and then I was able to capture all the water going around, uh, going around the lighthouse. Um, January 6th, 2020, Another storm like this came in and it actually took down the lighthouse and uh, it was uh, demolished and uh, through fundraising efforts here in Lion's Head, um, it is back. So they, they moved it uh, a little farther inland. It's pretty close to where it was. They made a sturdier outside and um, it's exactly, uh, it looks exactly as it does now and uh, let's hope that uh, it survives more onslaughts. This is probably due to the, uh, the, the high water levels of, uh, of the Great Lakes, and uh, there's so much more water to, to throw at, uh, at, at the shoreline, including lighthouses. Now we're gonna go for a little journey across the ocean. And naturalists do like uh, iconic things too. So you probably recognize this, this tower. This is a, the Eiffel Tower, of course. And uh, Di and I were there in 2016. And um, I have uh, three night shots here to show you from, uh, from our trip there. And um, when I plan a picture, it's uh, largely from other people's ideas. So other people have a, um, have a thought and I go, well, I can, I can try to do that as well. And then you just kind of put your own twist onto it. And, uh, you know, so um, this is an idea that was, uh, that someone gave me. The hardest part about this uh, picture was waiting for the right um, vehicle to drive by to cast all those lights that are, that are going by that you can see from the center to the right. So this was a 10 second exposure and, um, uh, F13, ISO 50, is um, I wanted to uh, let in as much light as I could in a very, you know, in that period of time. Uh, so this is, uh, this is uh, another time exposure. And then um, you'll recognize this stately lady in Notre Dame, doesn't look like this now, but um, in 2016, I had another vision for uh, a, a dusk shot, a twilight shot. Uh, not a completely dark shot, but so I can capture some blue in the sky. And, um, and of course that required some long exposures as well. You can see the character, you know, there's some figures down the bottom here that are moving. You know, so this was a, a quarter of a second, this, this shot. And um, so this is uh, Notre Dame showing, uh, of course, it doesn't look like this now. They're trying to fix it. So the next one is uh, the Louvre. And um, the night that we arrived, it started to rain. And uh, it didn't rain that hard, but we, uh, we wanted to do some night, uh, night photography. And uh, so we did go out. And the light, the Lorraine actually, I think, added to this picture because that's what's give, giving the, the really nice uh, uh, reflection of the, of the pyramid onto the water. And then, of course, and then, um, then you have it on the outside. So when I walked around this, uh, the, the center court of the Louvre, I really didn't know what I, uh, what I was going for. I had seen lots of other pictures of Louvre. And then when I came upon this one right around the corner, and then that's when I knew, I knew. Uh, it's funny how sometimes it just, it just hit me that, you know, this is, this is your shot. So 
Um, this is six seconds. Um, I took this picture. And you can see that, uh, and there wasn't many people here, you could, but if you look, you can see there are a couple of people over here and there's people over here. And then there's a bride, actually a bride um, with a photo shoot with, uh, with her other photographers over here, which kind of, uh, they kind of dissolve into the picture and, and almost add to the picture. Um, so this is a, uh, this is a definite favorite of mine uh, of the Louvre. So back across the ocean, down to South America and um, to Dionyze uh, 30th anniversary uh, trip. So we took a trip to Peru on a, uh, a guided tour and um, we went to Machu Picchu and this is one of the uh, places in the world that actually takes your breath away once you come upon it. Um, I was worried that it really wasn't going to be all that, all that was supposed to be, but it was. And uh, when you see those, those giant mountains in the back, and then you see the village all intact, and uh, of course the river uh, is down on the left-hand side that snakes around this mountain. And um, the reason of all the pictures that I took of Machu Picchu, and it's one of those places you can't stop taking pictures, I picked this one because it shows all the terraces of the farming valley, of the farming uh, Incan people. You know, so you could see um, all the terraces all going down, down to the left here, and then they all go wrap around here, and then this is the, the, the inner city. And if you've ever been there, it's, uh, it's quite, quite something. Now, if you zoom in, you know, there is a line of people that go, goes there. You can see people here and then they all snake all through here, little tiny dots of people here. And then they all come out down here and then out. And then you have to go in there with a the guide. But it was a very enjoyable place to go. And hopefully we can go back there one day. Over to the East Coast into Newfoundland. This is, um, this is Spiller's Cove, which is near Bonavista. So I saw this picture of this uh, sea stack in a brochure on our way on the ferry. So I did a little bit of research. The internet's a wonderful thing. And I did a bit of research to figure out where this was. And I found it was Spiller's Cove. And then Di and I went there and, uh, and, and I got my shot. So Diane was a little freaked out when I, uh, there was puffins over here on top of this rock. And Diane was a little bit freaked out when I went all the way over here to the edge. And now I really don't like heights, but I just snuck up a little bit so I could get pictures of the puffins. And there may be one puffin in this show later on. Uh, a couple more from Newfoundland. This is Pike's Arm up near Twillingate. And um, this picture should break all the rules of photography because I'm shooting right into the sun. This is the sun up here. But I was able to use uh, software to bring up, uh, uh, bring up all the highlights here of all the, um, all the ice that's in every little bay. And there's a, uh, a little fishing, uh, fishing shack. And then there you can see the, the, the lobster traps here and anchors and, and the green. and just a, uh, a kind of a nice picture that shows the landscape of Newfoundland here. Um, that year that we went, there was ice uh, choking every little spot around Newfoundland. It was very difficult for the fishermen that year because they couldn't, couldn't get out to go fishing. So they couldn't even put out their little dories or their big fishing boats to get, um, to get any lobster or uh, or fish, so it was a it was a tough year for them. Good year for us as tourists because we got to see all the icebergs and all the ice. You can see an iceberg off here, and actually that iceberg was so big that uh, Diane and I ended up on this road because we could see the top of the iceberg. And uh, so then we kept driving uh, until we found it. And then I found this idyllic little scene here. This is near Twillingate, um, near. Um, I'm trying to remember the name of the town. Uh, oh, Trinity, near, uh, near Trinity. There was the Skirwing Trail. Uh, it's a spectacular trail. If you ever get to Newfoundland, uh, you could go on this trail. It's a little remote and a little rough, 
but uh, it was well, it's well worth it. Um, we saw bald eagle over here flying around. Um, we were uh, a little embarrassed as we were walking around the trail and then we could hear, excuse me, excuse me. And this young lady runs by, it's like she runs by. And um, it was, uh, you know, and we're trudging up these hills and, and that. It was, uh, it was kind of tough, but anyway, some scenery second to none. And this is uh, Trinity back, back here. This one is for Tom Wilson. Tom, if you're there, this is for you. This is Saturn. Everybody might have guessed this. So this is a, a kind of a neat shot. Saturn was really close to the planet this year, to our planet. And um, so I tried to take it with my big bird lens. So I have a 600 millimeter lens with a two times converter. And um, I set it up and um, I, uh, the hardest part was trying to find Saturn in my, in my lens and then actually focus. Because uh, I couldn't do automatic focus. So I'm, uh, so the Earth's moving and I'm trying to keep an eye on Saturn and I'm hand focusing, trying to get that. And so it took a few tries, but in the end, I think, um, I think I was able to, uh, to pull that one off there. Anyway, so um, it's kind of neat that Saturn actually exists, not just in, uh, not in just in other people's pictures. This is um, the famous pine from Kilbear Provincial Park. And um, uh, my friend and I, uh, we snowshoed in one very cold January night. It was minus 22. I was just frozen by the end of all this. But um, that, is, that is Perry Sound behind. It's not a sunrise or a sunset. That's Perry, the town of Perry Sound. So we have a, a 30 second exposure here, which brings in lots and lots of light. And uh, that's why you can see all the stars and, um, and then it you know, opens up the color of the, of the snow uh, down below. And it creates this really nice, uh, really nice um, image of a tree silhouetted in, in the nighttime, so. This is perhaps the highlight of my uh, year this year. Um, I couldn't have been happier when Comet Neowise appeared in the sky. So I was out uh, almost every opportunity. And um, so at the beginning of the year, Neowise was uh, appearing in the morning sky in, this, in, the, in the east. So you had to get up at four and wait for sunrise and then um, Comet Neowise was surely slowly showing itself, and then you had you know 45 minutes or an hour before the sun popped up, and then it was gone. And then um, Neowise wanted uh, started appearing in the nighttime, so um, Diane and I uh, we met our daughter up at the uh, at the very end of Highway Six there in Tobermory at the Gap, if people know what the Gap is, and. Um, we saw the forecast, it was, it was so cloudy and uh, we didn't think that we were going to see it. And then all of a sudden the clouds moved and, uh, and there was Comet Neowise. So I spent quite a lot of time uh, taking pictures of Neowise everywhere I could. Um, you can see that it has the two tails, there's the main tail and then it has another tail uh, right here. Uh, so I was quite happy with this, uh, with this picture. And then um, as I'm looking at my LCD, I could see that, I uh, well, what, what is what is with this picture? What is all of a sudden jumped into my picture? And I couldn't figure it out. And then I realized the Northern Lights. The Northern Lights were showing themselves um, with the comet. And I, I just couldn't believe it. Anyway, so I spent the next half hour taking pictures of the comet with, with, uh, with the Northern Lights. And uh, until the, you know, the comet eventually goes down so low, you can't see it anymore. But I was, uh, but I came away very happy with uh, with uh, this picture. Probably with my one of my more favorite pictures. For uh, it's going to take a lot to to remove that one from my memory. That anyways, you can see the the pillars here, and um, granted, you can't see this perfectly with your naked eyes. Of course, I'm shooting at thirty seconds here, and I'm. Um, you know, I'm getting in lots and lots of light, which gives the color and uh, allows us to see more stars and all that. 
but um, we could definitely see the band. You could definitely see the band of uh, the Garden Lights. Uh, Milky Way, another favorite thing of mine to do. And um, rather than just showing you a plain old Milky Way shot, it, it always helps to have something in the foreground. And you can guess who these guys are. So that's me and this is Diane. Diane has good sport and she joins me in most of my photography excursions. So the hardest part of this picture was taking staying still for 30 seconds while the uh, camera did its thing and captured all the light. The other, uh, the other, this is my brother's place up on uh, St. Joe's Island and uh, a nice rickety old barn. And our timing was perfect. One year we went up there and um, to see, you know, and I was able to, again, using an app, I was able to uh, plan where a Milky Way would be and uh, right over top of, uh, right over top of their barn. Okay, um, moving on to flowers. And um, so these are wood lilies. And I picked this one because there are three of them. So that's uh, kind of nice. And uh, just to go through the flowers here, um, flowers seem to have more impact when they have water on them. And uh, they really, really pop. And um, taking pictures of flowers is not an easy thing to do because uh, uh, you have all the light um, to worry about. You've got um, wind. Um, it's usually dark. Um, sometimes it's too sunny. So there's a lot of things to consider when you're taking pictures of uh, flowers. This is a dwarf lake iris, uh, a species of concern here uh, in Canada. This is a, a lady slipper, and I can't believe the lady slippers up here. It's just like they're just like weeds here. There are just so many of them, and um, we have Indian paintbrush behind. But you can see that you know the fine detail of this flower. You got some nice uh, hairs, and of course this one's early morning, so it's got a little nice little bit of dew on it as well. So then the question is, if you have a clump of flowers, more impressive, or a single flower? So then if you have a clump of flowers and then you got to get them all in focus or try to, you know, so there is, um, there is some technical uh, aspects of, of taking a picture. Of course, I like to have a shallow background, you know, so I use a narrow, a narrow aperture. But again, uh, there is a uh, fine spot where you keep everything in focus and you blur the background. You know, so that's a, an interesting uh, experiment. But flowers don't move, so it, uh, you have the time. This is the uh, uh, water lily. And I had this shot in my head for quite a while, and we did this from the canoe. And a very small, uh, uh, um, a very big aperture, 2.8, just to bring it out by itself and blur everything else around it to make it pop more. Uh, we have uh, lots of orchids here on the peninsula, and this is a, a Calypso orchid, one of the rare orchids uh, here. And um, so I was able to find one, haven't seen one since this, but um, anyways, it has lots of fine little spider hairs there and all the little feathers, all the little parts of the uh, orchid that are nice. This one is a little bit more uh, available. This is the Ramset orchid. And we saw some this year. We didn't see any last year, but we did see some. Uh, we saw, see some this year. So what I, you know, you can have a lot of uh, things to do when you take a picture of an orchid, or a very small flowers. Is to, you know, what do you bring into detail? What uh, what stays out of focus? How uh, you know? So you have lots of options to take pictures of of flowers, and then you can make flowers more interesting by adding things to them like bugs. So here um, I used my big lens, my normal birding lens, to take a picture of the monarch and which, which created that whole dreamy uh, clean background that I like to get in my bird photos. And uh, so it, uh, this uh, freshly hatched monarch, really vibrant colors. And, um, and this one, this one works. And there was a, this is a um, northern crescent on a plant called the sneezeweed. 
and um, we were hiking and then I saw this uh, butterfly laying on this flower and then uh, so then it's just like bird photography I just waited and waited and waited for it to come back and then I had to uh, and then to take the picture uh, so, but it makes uh, the flower more interesting and also makes the insect more interesting uh, together this is a picture from uh, I took this when uh, well, when I was when we were living in really we went on a really a naturalist hike over at Georgia Bay Islands and this is a uh, pink uh, lady slipper a water moccasin um, and it uh, has a, a little uh, butterfly on it, it the, yeah and a white slant line moth that's the, the moth that's on there so it, it kind of makes that picture I think a little bit more interesting one of um in 2017 I visited my first wild uh, sunflower farm and I was overwhelmed at the photographic opportunities at a, at a farm, a sunflower farm. And um, so, of course, the monarchs were there, which was really, really nice. And then lots and lots of bees. This is kind of the picture that I was hoping to get, you know, a nice blue sky contrasting against the yellow, yellow flower and, and the center. And then the bee just added that little, that little bit uh, to it. And I'll just finish off flowers with my trillium collection. So here's the white trillium. This is from Grant's Woods. Always uh, lots of great flowers in Grant's Woods. Of course, it has a water drop on it, but a little bit more interesting. And then the painted, uh, painted trillium, uh, one of my favorites. I haven't seen one of them since I've left the early area, but this one was uh, uh, definitely saturated and made for a, a nice photo. I've been looking and searching for another trillium like this. This is from Grant's Woods as well. I've never seen a red trillium that has bloomed so perfectly uh, like this, you know, where all the petals are all sticking out just nice and flat. Looks like the symbol of Ontario, that one. And um, but anyways, I'll keep searching. And um, as the next flower, the last of the trilliums is the nodding trillium. This is a difficult shot to get because they bend down towards the ground. And this is almost, you almost have to lay down to get a shot like this. And then at the same time, fight off all the black flies and mosquitoes um, while you take the picture. Okay, I'm gonna move into fauna now. So all my critters, this is a uh, wolf. Uh, you can see by his radio collar from Algonquin Park. So I took this picture from the observation deck in Algonquin and um, they had a moose carcass off the uh, visitor center and um, as we were setting up the moose or the uh, wolf was there eating the carcass and um, I slow you know I was saying okay he's gonna be there for a while and then as soon as they start setting up he started run, uh, moving away and uh, so I put on my two times converter on the 600 and then I just started clicking away as the fox was running. And what really amazed me is that the fox actually stopped and looked at me while I'm taking pictures and he is about a kilometer away. So I don't know if it was me or somebody else that he decided to stop and have a look. This is a, a nice healthy coyote from um, in between Warminster and Coldwater. If you know the flats there, that's, the, uh, that's where that, uh, that coyote was. It was uh, late in the day, um, and that's why you have that color on the, on the snow. And then, of course, he is nice golden color from the, uh, from the setting, setting sun. Being in Aurelia, you can make many trips to uh, bear country in Algonquin. This is in the Mew Lake um, airstrip area. And the bears were, one year where they were just, uh, there were so many of them. And uh, photographers were everywhere taking pictures of them. And um, this mama bear was looking after her two kids. I tried to get that other one to turn around, but he just wouldn't, uh, he just wouldn't do it for me. But anyways, I got mama and, uh, and the one, one little cub there. This is where it's handy to have a, a big long lens. You don't have to worry about um, bears chasing you. And if you do, you just have to run faster than anybody else. I know that's an old joke. Okay, uh, in Algonquin, moose. I got a couple of moose pictures here for you. 
This is a, uh, a nice morning, early morning. This is like 5.30 in the morning. Uh, moose out there with a beautiful sunrise and the moose out there eating his, uh, eating the water lilies. Just a nice, uh, peaceful, peaceful scene. Uh, I was up there on a guided tour on a tour boat. So that's how I, uh, up on the top of Opiongo Lake. On that same trip, we, uh, we were taking pictures of uh, moose, of course, early in the morning. And this is, I mean, you know, I took, I took, uh, you know, well over a thousand pictures there over two days. And um, this is basically what I was looking for, a, like a moose uh, eating water lilies and then uh, lifting its head up and all the water uh, falling down. It, it, uh, to me, it creates a really nice uh, story and action of what, uh, what's going on. I went, uh, I went to Algonquin quite a few times um, when I lived in Aurelia. Um, quite often in the, in the first thing in the morning and this particular morning it was like minus 20 and um, I could see there was, a, there was seven moose here and um, they're all frolicking in the snow and I was kind of uh, disappointed that the sun was behind, uh, behind the moose. You can see that it's highlighted uh, on the edges. But as, uh, after I got home, I was uh, kind of pleased because that light gave me, um, uh, allowed me to see the breath of the moose with, and then the snow falling. And I'm not sure if I would have seen that had the sun been on the, on the, on the preferred side. So um, I was it, uh, so it, it worked out uh, for me. Uh, here is a, well, last year we had, uh, uh, you know, a dump of snow, and of course I got bird feeders up, and we got lots of little squirrels running around, and this was like playing whack-a-ball, so I, you know, they, they would be, um, the squirrels would go under the snow, and then they would just pop up, and then you'd have to guess where they were, and then anyways, I got quite a few cute little pictures of, uh, of squirrels. And a neighbor found a, a little squirrel hole, where they were baby squirrels, so I couldn't resist taking a picture of a baby squirrel, and I waited, I waited and waited until one would peek out, and then I'd, I'd get my little baby squirrel in the hole shot. So it's always it's uh, it's amazing how they really uh, really camouflage inside there, and who can't resist a doe and a fawn. Uh, no special story from that other than it's a doe and a fawn and it's a really cute mother, mother, son slash daughter uh, picture. Algonquin also has uh, pine martens that people like to photograph and um, we were hiking and then we saw one on our trail in front of us. So he kept looking at us and then so until he finally went up into this little tree so I had my camera on my tripod and I just went ahead, slowly took a picture, went ahead slowly, went ahead until I finally could get into a position where I could see him. I don't know if he's not happy with me or not, but I picked this picture because of his little, little teeth, his little, uh, little look on his face. Last year, Diane and I were, uh, we were down at the local wetland and um, there was a beaver and he scared, he slapped his tail when he saw us and he scared the heck out of us. And um, so we said, well, okay, well, you we want to see that beaver again, but next thing you know, he pops right up again. And he just ate his little, uh, his, his little stick there, you can see in his paws, sir. And uh, he just ate, and I, you know, I was just able to crank off more than enough pictures. And I picked this one because I like his little orange teeth. And so you can see his eyes and his little teeth and his whiskers and, um, of course, the log. Of course, I'm driving around all the time with my camera, and um, there's a there's a, a river not very far from here, and um, I could see a mink, and he was frog playing in the snow, and he would go on in the river and then climb around and just uh, he was doing uh, little belly slides and running, and so I picked this one because it. It actually has him midair. He's actually looks like he's flying, and it's actually in focus. So um, it was kind of a kind of a neat, neat picture of a little American mink. A little river otter, northern northern American river otter. This was in Algonquin as well, 
And um, they do have them here. I just have to find one. But anyways, it's another, uh, another neat little critter that, uh, that I like taking pictures of. Um, Mr. Fox. This was one of the pictures that I, you know, I really had in my head that I wanted to get, you know, a nice fox with lights of, with a beautiful coat uh, in the snow, with little nice eyes and uh, just a general, not bad, uh, not bad little portrait. Um, anyways, Mr. Fox. Not far from Brecken is, um, there was a den that a friend had told me about. And um, this was a case of waiting and waiting and waiting for the little fox kits to pop out and pop out they did. And so I get my little cute fox portrait of these, these little guys. So these guys, these fox kits are um, our house. This is uh, in our front the boulevard on, on the street. So there's a den not very far from our, um, our home uh, in the woods. And um, so every night, Diane and I would go for a walk and we would see the little fox kits playing in the boulevard. So one night I just, I uh, sat in the car and I just backed it up and I just waited and whoop, out they popped. And then I, I, took, uh, I took lots of pictures trying to get that, you know, those, uh, those kids playing, uh, kids playing with each other. This is my $100 bat shot. So this is uh, from Arizona, this is a pallet bat. And uh, at the workshop I was at in Arizona, you paid $100 to, a, uh, to the person who has this little pawn. And your camera is set up pre-focused on a particular spot. And when a bat flies through a laser beam it, uh, or infrared beam, it uh, activates the, the flashes. And um, your camera is um, shooting all the time. And if you're fortunate enough to uh, have your shutter go off the same time a bat goes through, and then you're golden. If not, then you're not. Um, so this is my $100 bat shot because I got one picture and this is it. And then, so. Um, but anyways, all you need is one, right? This is uh, from Newfoundland. This is a humpback whale. And when we were there, we were fortunate enough to see um, whales um, going after capelin. So they would lunge, lunge feed. They would come up underneath the water, uh, from underneath the water, and they would go up, and then they would scoop up a uh, huge um, uh, amounts of fish in their mouths. And here's a uh, Chinook salmon. And I took this from the bridge in Thornbury, so where they have the fish ladder there. And I just kind of hung over the edge, waiting and waiting for, uh, for uh, the salmon to come up. And then, of course, I take the picture. Lots of action there, lots of water. You can see its eye. The eyes are very important to me in all my pictures, whether it's a fish or a mink or a moose or an alligator. This is from Florida when we were there and just this alligator just moving along really slow, which created a really nice effect for me. Okay, it's eight o'clock and my last is my favorite uh, bunch of pictures is the birds. And uh, so here is uh, um, Northern Cardinal. This is the picture that started it all off for me the thinking or, or knowing or making me think that I could take pictures of birds. This was with my little bridge camera. I had it set up on a tripod pointing out our window in our backyard. And um, I've been known to put perches on my feeders. And, um, and then the bird lands and I take a picture. And uh, so it still takes lots of patience and that, but uh, this is a, uh, one of my, still one of my favorite pictures. Um, lots of snow and I everything just worked out really well and I think this is the picture that kind of started me on my path of taking bird pictures. So this year um, we have lots of evening grouse beaks and I've seen lots of uh, postings from Aurelia and all around um, where grosbeaks are all 
um, they're erupting from the north and all headed, headed south in search of food. So um, I've loaded up on sunflower seed and hopefully uh, they'll stay around for a while. So this is a female evening grosbeak. And yes, that is a perch attached to my bird feeder. And um, so I just kind of have to wait and wait and wait. And um, not every picture works, but uh, some do uh, like, like this one. So they're pretty aggressive to each other. Everybody wants, everybody wants a piece of food. So this is a, uh, a male evening gross beak. Um, they are actually surprisingly difficult to take a picture of to get a right exposure because if you expose for just the bird, then the wings will, the white of the wings will wash out. So you have to, have to be very careful. And, but you can see the, you know, the nice fine lines of the wings here uh, in, in this picture um, of this male evening gross beak. So Diane counted them today. I think we had 60. She counted 60 uh, gross beaks today. So lots. Baltimore Oriole. This is from uh, our home in Aurelia. I had uh, Oriole feeders uh, set up and I had a, a attach, attached a, a nice branch uh, from apple tree from our back of our property. And um, so there was a matter of sitting on the deck and waiting for the bird to land. Um, all the, you know, most of these pictures, it's, it's patience and waiting and, and uh, grabbing the right pose and uh, looking at the picture of the, you know, the head of the bird and which way it's facing and all those things. Um, this is a common red pole, a nice bright male. This is from the menacing wetlands. Uh, Diane and I were driving around and we saw this, this whole flock of little red poles that were eating these weed, uh, weed seeds. And uh, so it just uh, proceeded to click away. And um, this is a kind of a neat picture because the, the, it's got a little bit of a fluff of its feathers. It was a particularly cold day to, uh, that day. And the, when we had the window down of the car, you know, we were cold inside the car. So these, these feisty little guys are out there you know, trying to survive and fly in the, fly in the cold weather. So common red pole. Last year in Lion's Head, there's a, uh, there was a whole flock of uh, cedar waxwings all uh, attacking the, this mountain ash. So uh, again, down there uh, waiting and, and, um, and hoping to get a shot. So when I try to take a picture of a bird, I always try to get the bird uh, by itself. And it, uh, it's easy to take pictures, somewhat easy to take pictures of birds in a tree but not so easy to get it all by itself. So that's why I selected this picture. That's why it's one of my favorites because it, the whole scene is nice and clean uh, without any uh, major distractions of uh, branches. Same thing with this uh, Bohemian waxwing picture. This, uh, there was uh, hordes of them in the tree when I was taking the picture, but I was, um, I waited for one to actually fall on it, you know, the, to be by itself to, to eat, these, uh, eat these ornamental crab. By the way, um, you saw a mountain ash on the last picture and a crab apple on this one. Guess what I planted in our yard this year? Yes, apple in one and a mountain ash in the front. So hopefully I'll have these pictures. I'll have my own trees to feed my own birds. This is a uh, male common yellow throat. And uh, it's just the colors in the background that really, uh, that really do it for me on this one. It, uh, this is uh, in Maine. It was, uh, they have a plant there called uh, Grand Rhododendron. And uh, anyways, this little guy popped up on this little branch and uh, a really interesting uh, color background. This picture is a bay-breasted warbler from Maine again, and he's eating a, um, uh, spruce butt worm. And um, this picture has been used uh, a few times by uh, age, uh, cons conservation agencies. And what they've used this picture for is to illustrate that birds are important for our economy because they eat bugs. And um, without 
birds eating bugs, the bugs are going to uh, ruin our forestry products, among other things. So we need the birds, you know, for our economy, and um, it's just not for for looks. Anyway, so I'm I'm proud that these pictures have been used for for a variety of reasons. This is a golden wing warbler, and it's from the over in the Cowan Trail, uh, where there are a few. Um, um, I think they're still there. Anyway, it's just um, just a remarkable little bird, bird that's in trouble uh, for a variety of reasons. And um, this one, uh, it's been used quite a bit of times for from Audubon, and I'm happy that they're using this picture to um, to further their causes for bird conservation. So this, um, that's I'm happy with that one. And uh, this is a northern perula. And the northern perula is another warbler, a very small warbler, and it uses old man's beard lichen to build its nest. And it was very appropriate that I, I really like this picture from a, um, that it's posed in with old man's beard lichen. It, uh, it, it just creates a whole nice little environment. And uh, it, I, uh, when I put together my favorite shots, this one always kind of works its way in there because the bird is so colorful, but it's a really nice, uh, I think it's a very nice scene. This little guy, Mr. Scarlet Tanager, he was, uh, he entertained the residents here where we live for about a week. He was uh, not a typical Scarlet Tanager. He, um, he must have liked us because he was here. Uh, we would see him all the time. He would be up and down people's driveways, picking, uh, picking food, and uh, of course Arnie's out there with his camera uh, taking pictures. Um, I've got so many pictures of this guy, but um, the happiest I am was when they hop on a perch. So um, I have lots of grass pictures, but the more natural picture in my mind would be on a perch. And so when he finally hopped on perch and everything's in focus, and then I'm a, I'm a happy camper. Uh, this is a uh, little plover from Wasega Beach, a little piping plover, endangered species. And uh, this was an Arnie lay down on the ground shot with his big lens and lots of reach. And it, uh, everything else is blurred in front and back because of the aperture, but it creates this cute little picture of a piping plover. And I must have got him really early because he has no uh, rings or bands on his feet. Actually, I have that picture right above my head here on a big, big canvas. Mr. Pilliad Woodpecker and his son peeking out the hole. This is kind of an unusual shot where you have them both sticking out their head like that, where the more typical shot is like this, you know, where they're all sticking their heads out and dads come in or mom and dad come in, come in to feed. I like this picture because you can see the eye of all three, all three little babies. I've got more pictures of Peleides this year, but uh, I still I come back to this one. This was a shot from this year, a, a, a northern flicker, formerly called the yellow shafted flicker, and you can see why they call it yellow shafted. Over in the west coast, they have red, red under the wings, and over here we have yellow. And this he's carrying out a piece of fecal. A fecal sac. So what I learned when I was researching about this um, is that the baby, baby birds kind of poop in a diaper and, uh, and then the mom and dad take away the diaper. It's, you know, it doesn't mess up the nest or anything. It just kind of, here it is and there it goes. When I was in that wildflower farm a couple of years ago, I heard an indigo bunting and I patiently waited until the, and I moved until the bird landed on a sunflower. One of my, uh, uh, my treasured pictures and something I hope to uh, duplicate one day. So indigo bunting, a nice bright bird on a nice yellow flower. I have to tell you the story about this, this robin because this is uh, our next door neighbor in Aurelia at a uh, mountain ash tree and I climb on the roof to get an eyeball shot, eye to eye shot with this robin, rather than uh, getting an under shot. 
not very often you see a shrike at eye level, but um, I was able to get this last winter. Cute little guy with his little beak, very, very uh, close cousins of the loggerhead shrike that uh, is endangered over on over in Cardin. That's uh, what we're trying to preserve. This is the northern, northern shrike. Here is a, I take shots from my blind and here is a blind shot. So this is at the Aurelia landfill. There was a kingfisher that visited all the time. I could see him every time I went. So I just stayed in my blind for three hours until he finally arrived and he has a crayfish. You can see the little crayfish there with his little claws going, uh, don't eat me. But his pleas went unheard. This is from our garden here in uh, where we live. So hummingbird and a Mexican sunflower. Here's a road runner from Arizona when we were down there and the runner of uh, the operator of the course said, hey, do you want to see it eat a scorpion? And everybody said, sure, why not? And so we got the cameras ready and and there we got to see him do a little flip to do, and there goes the scorpion. I just got a few more slides here. I'm just gonna go a little quicker. Uh, thanks to my friend, David Homer. I know you're out there, David. Anyways, I was able to get these uh, great, great pictures of loons. One of my favorites here, because you have the baby on the back and the loon is actually facing us instead of running away. Because a lot of times they would just kind of swim away from you. Uh, but uh, nice here, parent and parent and chip shot. And a hooded merganser, always, uh, always love to get pictures of these, especially with their hood up. Now one that, and why I picked this picture, because of the drop of water on its beak, just ready to fall off. This kind of adds that extra little bit of pop. And again, the bird is swimming towards me, not away from me. Uh, here we are in Newfoundland here for, uh, for this shot. This is Northern Gannets. And I like this shot just because of the, the symmetry of the, of the two birds. One's ready to take off and the other one's uh, peeking up in between, in between the two wings. You can see it's nicely colored, colored feet, big blue eyes or the blue rims around his eyes. This is a picture from uh, the Farne Islands in England. And um, the, the puffin just came back with its uh, sand eels to feed its babies. So this is a new picture. I've never shown this one before. And I've never shown this picture before. This is the, uh, the sand eel cranes. This is from last weekend. And I was positioned in a great spot. Sand eel cranes were really close to me. And um, they were, over here and they just kept flying over here. So all I had to do was just follow the birds over and take pictures as they were uh, flying in. So it was uh, good timing on my part and good right place, right time. I find myself doing more environmental shots now. Um, birds that are in the environment instead of a close I still won't stop doing the close tight shots, but I, I do like environmental shots. Here's a nice uh, evening, uh, or sorry, Eastern wood. I'm talking too fast now, Eastern Meadowlark. And uh, Diane and I were watching a hawk that was beyond this one, way behind, and then this Eastern Meadowlark just landed right in front of us. So who am I to give up, uh, uh, take away that shot? So here we are. Cape May Warbler from this spring landing in these uh, willow and eating all the little bugs. So a nice, clean, wide open shot. Same with this little marsh wren. Uh, the really naturalist came up to visit us last year and we went to this wetland and the little marsh wren was singing his little heart out. And um, so it almost looks like he has a little, like he's got stilts or something. But it was a nice environmental shot. Same with this one. This was uh, last year. I didn't have my big bird lens with me, but I saw this uh, warbler, uh, black burning warbler, hunting through the through the these, the small jack pine. So it ended up turning out to be uh, kind of a nice picture because you have this little splash of color, in amongst all the uh, all the 
of the branches. Similar to this one, here a yellow rump warbler. I took this picture this fall. So he's in his fall colors, but it uh, really nice sunshine shining. This was early in the morning, so we have that nice color, not harsh sunlight, and it, it, it's a nice environmental, uh, environmental picture. Uh, here is a red winged blackbird, and I really like the contrast, you know, the pop of color with its red epaulets, you know, the kind of the monotone background. Here he's singing, but everybody's seen that. And then this year I raised the bar a little bit and I took a, I went there with the sole purpose of trying to get him with his breath. So everything worked out well. It took me a while to figure out how, how to do it, but uh, in the end um, I was able to, um, to pull it off. So singing in um, you know below zero temperatures and having the sun in the right place, uh, everything everything worked out really well. Um, so I've had a good year this year. Um, a nice little merlin, which uh, which are around here a lot, feeding on our little birds, and he just stayed on his little fence post. Fence post right. This was right outside the uh, the car window. Uh, great gray owl. We can all hope for a great gray owl this uh, this year to come down and visit us. This was one had done a Whitby in uh, 2015, 14 or 15. Uh, and this is the cover of my uh, calendar this year. And uh, uh, interesting picture because there's no snow, but he's got lots of color with the red berries. I think the high bush cranberry and an old rickety uh, fence post. And a short-eared owl. This is my last picture. Short-eared owl. And uh, I've entered this one in a few contests, and uh, it always comes out with very far favorable results and the judges uh, liking the, the symmetry of it. And um, it's kind of the two different things here. You have a nice bird, yet you've got the wind turbines in the background and uh, which are detrimental to birds, you know? So it's kind of a, kind of an interesting, sad story at the same time. Anyways, that's, um, that's my show and um, I'm uh, ready for questions. I think I'm gonna stop sharing here. And um, where are we? Yeah, so we've had a couple questions um, come in and I'll just read some off to you. Um, so one of the first ones was, what was the name of the color slash decolor software, please? Um, oh, yeah, it was yeah. Uh, Nick. It was a Nick software. It's owned by DXO now. So there is a suite of five different tools that you can, um, you can um, change color, sharpen, uh, take noise away, but it's uh, DXO is the company that has it now. Awesome. Okay. Another question we have is, do you have a mental list of photos that you want to take each year, species you want to photograph? Yeah, uh, not a written list, but I do have a list in my head, yes. <laughs> it's kind of like, it's kind of like um, when I see it, I know it. Mm -hmm. um, but I... But I do go out for specific things, you know, just like you saw that red winged blackbird with the breath. You know, I've seen it, I've seen it before, and I go, hey, I wonder if I could do that. Um, there are certain birds that I really want to take pictures of. Um, and there's certain things that I want to see birds do that I want to take, take pictures of. Um, there's certain parts of the world I'd like to go, but, uh, you know, yeah. So, but like that lighthouse, it's just been, you know, it's something that's in my head. And, uh, you know, when I saw that happening, I knew, I knew exactly that um, that's, that's what I wanted. That's what I thought. That's a good question. Um, another question we have, um, so someone said great orchid photos. Um, do, or did you use a macro lens for any of them? If so, do you perform image stacking? Um, I'm trying to do image stacking. Image stacking is where you focus on different parts of the flower to add a very short uh, aperture. So you have a really uh, 
muted background and um, I've tried it. I haven't been very successful yet. Um, I think it's because I have to bend down and then I have to get up again. <laughs> That's my excuse and I'm sticking to it. But uh, I do use macro. Yes, I do use a macro lens and I also use my 70 to 200 um, 2.8 to, to do uh, flower shots. Okay. And if you use a, like a big focal length, especially if you have uh, not much in the background, like that orchid, that uh, lady, lady slipper I had a picture of with the, um, with the Indian paintbrush in the background, that was with a 7200. So I could really compress the background and then have a 2.8. Awesome. Okay. Um, another question, if you are heading out for a day of taking photos, what is in your bag? You must have items you recommend. I uh, camera body. <laughs> <laughs> well, it depends on what. Um, so that's a really good question because I can't carry everything in one bag and make it manageable. So I'm either going for birds, which I'll take the one to four hundred lens, and I'll take my six hundred plus. I'll take the uh, teleconverters. If I'm going for landscapes. Or uh, so this morning I went out for landscapes and I did a, I took a 1740, um, 24, 105 and my 70 to 200. That's pretty much my whole lens collection. If I'm going for flowers, I'll do, I'll, I'll probably just take my macro and my 70 to 200. Awesome. Um, another person said, I would love the meta, the metadata from Machu Picchu, Algonquin Red Canoe, the wolf from the observation deck in Algonquin, and the red winged blackbird. Um, maybe too many, so any you choose, please. And I would dearly love to know where you saw the Sandhill Cranes. Your work is simply amazing. Thank you so much for sharing so generous. The Sandhill Cranes were like five minutes away from here. They're all moving. Uh, they're all moving down the uh, the peninsula, and they're going down to. Um, they're all headed south. Um, the metadata. Um, I have to go back into share screen to get the metadata. Is that possible to get the contact name of that person? Then I can send all of them to that person. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. That would be the easiest way. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Okay, another question. What picture are you still trying to get? Do you have a bird that has eluded you? Well, the kingfisher, even though I have one great king picture, kingfisher picture, um, still like to get more pictures of the kingfisher. Um, I've never seen an orange crown warbler. I'd like to get a picture of an orange crown warbler. I haven't got any really good pictures of Wilson's warblers yet. Um, those are on my those are on my sort of nemesis list for for Ontario. I haven't got a really good picture of a loggerhead shrike from Cardin. Uh, that would be on my nemesis list. Uh, I've been okay in the owl department. Long-eared owl, not so not so much. Short-eared, okay. Um, yeah, so yeah, there's, there's always, there's always things to take pictures of. <laughs> I, I'm not a bird chaser. So if a rare bird will pop up somewhere, um, I'm not always going to chase it, but I may. Um, so a question from Dave Hawk, he says, what is the make model of kayak in your opening slide? Is it stable enough? Yes, um, I specifically bought that one. It's a uh, it's called a native native craft. Um, it weighs twenty eight pounds, and um, yeah, native watercraft out of North Carolina. I got it at um, what used to be the Muskoka Outfitters in uh, Bracebridge. Yeah, yeah. Um, hmm? Yeah, yeah, it's very stable. Actually, I think it has a, a tri hull. It's got a um, it's got a center, a flat center, and then it's got a um, and then it's got two hulls like this. So I sit in my camp. I have my camera, and I have my extend my legs out, 
the front, and then I have one short one at the front. So I can, uh, I, yeah, it's it's really good for photography. The problem, the only problem is, is that you have to have your canoe or your kayak pointing the right way, because you can't turn you can't turn the camera, as Dave probably knows. You can't turn your camera when it's on a tripod. So. Uh, another question, which is from Cam Curran, he asked, "What was the f-stop of the great gray owl shot?" I'd have to, I'll have to jump back in there to see that, but Cam, I'll send you a, I'll send you a message. Sounds good. Thanks. Okay. <laughs> um, okay. Another question. What came first, photography or nature knowledge? Meaning, did you know bird ID before getting more into photography? Yes. Yeah. I consider myself a birder first and then uh, the photography came afterwards. So um, I see my son is online there. Hi, Mart. Um, we were, uh, so we were birders and then we had kidlets and then the uh, photography kind of took a back seat because photography, uh, for those of you who are oldsters, you know that, you know, taking a roll of film of 24 cost you $24 and you had to wait a week to get your roll. So anyways, I, I just kind of left it for a while. And then um, when I retired, I bought my bridge camera that I took the Cardinal picture with. And then that just kind of, uh, everything grew from, uh, grew from there. So I reignited my knowledge or my excitement for birds and, uh, and photography. So it's kind of a nice union of, uh, of hobbies. So Diane likes, uh, Diane likes birding too, and she can hear better than me now. I just have to teach her how to bird, you know, the bird calls. And um, <laughs> she knows lots. <laughs> um, so it looks like one last question. It's from Martin. He says, would you ever do a big year? No, I don't think so. I'm kind of, I'm kind of doing, no, I'm not that committed. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, uh, I really should try one, but I don't think so. I don't think, I'm kind of doing a, I'm doing a, what's called a 5MR challenge right now. You know, you get to see your birds in your, uh, in your, um, in your five mile radius. And I've got 140, 141 this year from January, but uh, the people that are, that are doing it. So Ethan Melig is 191 and the people down on the East Coast or the west coast of lake huron they got 296 and you know like it's crazy but. yeah so i think those are all the questions we just also have some lovely messages coming in janet grant says thank you for the lovely show arnie we missed you in aurelia um carolyn said thank you for sharing your great photos makes me want to get out there and do more um yeah and those are all the questions. Um, Arnie, if you want to pull up the slides again and just show the very last one with some. Oh yeah, um, I can do that. This one. Is that the one you're? Yeah, you just have to share your screen. Oh, well. <laughs> I have to do that again. Okay, share screen. There we go. You know, if we do this often enough, it'll, uh, it'll, I'll actually know how to do it. There we go. Does that work? <laughs> yeah, perfect. All right. And then Claire, I think you're somewhere. Oh, there you are. Okay. Yep. Okay. So uh, this is our last webinar as part of the 2020 Adapted Passport to Nature program. If you missed out on any of our past webinars, you can actually find them on our website as we've recorded all of them. Um, next week on Monday, November 16th, we have a presentation coming up with the Nature Conservancy of Canada, and it will be on a virtual tour of the Cedarhurst Alvar. If you would like to attend, please RSVP to either Tanya or Laura, and both our credentials are at the bottom of the screen there. Um, we would also like to say a big thank you to everyone who donated when registering for this event. Throughout the pandemic, our need for nature has really grown, and we need your support to protect the important and beautiful landscapes we all love to explore. If you're interested in helping to protect nature in the region, you can definitely visit our website to make a donation. Thank you to everyone for attending and a special thank you again to Arnie for sharing his passion for photography. Thank <laughs> awesome. you, Arnie. Yeah, thank, thank you for you. <laughs>
I could I could feel all that those positive vibes coming through the uh, coming through the internet. Thanks, Arnie. It was great to see you.